Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, we are going to get started in just a few moments. We're letting uh, a lot of people in from the waiting room. Um, so thanks so much for being here, and we'll get started shortly. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Hi there. Hi there. How are you? Thank you so I'm, much. Um, I'm super excited. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I'm really Just excited. We're, I'm, um, I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Um, okay. Is there like a volume? Hmm. Here? I'm going to turn my volume the whole way up. I don't think we're experiencing that on our end. Um, so keep keep checking out your computer. See if everything's working out. Um, we're going to get started in just a sec, so no rush. Um, I'm seeing some of the participant numbers click up. So for those of you who are um, jumping in, we are thrilled that you're here. We're so excited to get started. And we'll um, wait just one more minute and jump right in. OK, I can hear you better. Amazing. Oh, good. <laughs> How are you doing? We are good. We are good. Happy to get started. Okay, I'm excited. I'm nervous and excited. <laughs> well, I think being nervous means you care. So in my head, I think when I get nervous, it's only because I care. So thanks, Jen. All right. I think we are at that magic hour, uh, which is 1132. And so in my head, that means let's do this. Uh, Thank you for jumping in and being so prompt. Um, we are thrilled to be here today. On behalf of Hatch and Vivi, I am so happy to welcome you. Um, we're thrilled to get started on what we know will be a really special conversation with a really special person, Dr. Becky. I'm Gretchen Richer, Head of Family Experience at Vivi. A little bit about Vivi, we are on a mission to reinvent childcare and earlier learning for today's families. And we're doing that in a few different ways. In New York, our three campuses specialize in learning and care for six weeks through five years. And then nationally, our in-home programs, which take our teachers and everything about the school, uh, that model and place it right inside your home. And we've expanded coverage to meet families literally where you are. Before we get started, I just wanna share a few program logistics and then we'll dive right in. We have a cool 45 minutes together, which I know is gonna fly by. Um, I'm gonna use the first 30 or so asking Dr. Becky a few questions based on the wonderful submissions by you, the audience. And I will say um, you've themed it up so nicely for us. There's so many similar questions out there, which for one moment, you are not alone. We're all in this together. And it's it's so nice to see that we're all grappling with these challenges together. Um, and then we'll head over to the chat function and use the rest of the time to answer as many live questions as possible. But that being said, the chat function is open now. So feel free to pop in questions as they come to you. And we'll try to get as many things answered as possible. Dr. Becky is so special in that she covers such a wide breadth of topics that there's just no way we're gonna get done and cover everything in 45 minutes. It's actually one of the things that literally made me nervous thinking about it because I have to hold myself back. Dr. Becky, there's so many things I wanna dive into. Um, but what I can promise that as one registrant requested, we will discover at least one practical applicable tool that will help you become a better parent. I know this. Even if it's just a small, simple phrase, a gesture or thinking that you can do each day to better connect with your children, I am sure a light bulb is going to go on at some point in this um, in this time. Also, the great news is that both Dr. Becky and Vivi offer amazing upcoming events that tackle some of the exact topics you're interested in. So please vi visit us at vivi.com slash events for more programming insights and resources on specific topics like potty training uh, and more. Um, and so let me stop sharing so we can really see all of the wonderful people who are out there. Yay! It's so nice to see you. Um, we're so lucky to have you, Dr. Becky. And at both Vivian Hatch, we strive to work for our families to meet them wherever they are with as many resources as possible to support the ups and the downs and the twists and turns that we know is the journey of parenthood. 
Similarly, Dr. Rebecca Kennedy, AKA Dr. Becky does just the same. And I'm just gonna throw out a couple tidbits, even though I know you need no introduction for many people who are on the stage here. Um, you're a clinical psychologist, a mom of three, which I could full stop there, um, but you're really rethinking the way we raise our children and the ways we share our thinking with one another expertise in parenting, child development, equipping parents with the tools they need to strengthen parent-child relationships, decrease problem behaviors, and build more peaceful homes. And so whether you found her from her Good Inside podcast, blogs, newsletters, to following her on Instagram, to parenting workshops, I, I'm so impressed and proud of you for endeavoring to share the practical tools to a wide audience. And as you can see, what a beautiful and supportive online community you've cultivated in the process. So welcome. Uh, turn it over to you for a sec before I start hitting you up with questions. Well, that was the nicest <laughs> introduction ever. I feel really good about myself right now. It's downhill, okay. downhill for the rest of my Thursday. So that's <laughs> I'll take it. Um, for everyone who has their video off, I totally respect that we, we all are doing a million things. So just amazing you showed up. If you can put your video on, that would be awesome. I truly do vibe off the energy and I can tell when I'm talking about something that's boring and something that's interesting based on um, your looks. So if I'm talking <laughs> about something boring, roll your eyes away. So I can be like, oh, cool. Let's move on. Um, and this just makes it feel so live and like a community. So maybe you just turned on. That means so much. I toggle between screens when I talk to audiences. I really like to see everyone. So it feels real. So thank you. Um, I don't even know anything I can add to what Gretchen said. Like there's nothing more about me. Like she just named everything good about me in my life. Um, <laughs> but no, the, the thing I'll add is I'm always just mindful that whenever I talk on Instagram or, you know, at a company or here, um, I really don't want any of you to think that like, I do all the things I'm going to share with you with my own kids all the time. Cause I truly do not. And if my husband was here, he'd be like, yeah, no, she doesn't. I often show her one of her old posts. And I often say to her, like, you would really like this woman. Dr. Becky could like really help us in our home. So, um, my kids have Becky as their mom. They really do. I wouldn't want anyone to have Dr. Becky as their mom. Like you don't want someone who like always has good ideas. You want to be able to learn. You want to be able to learn from a struggle. That's when kids, um, learn so much. That's when relationships get so much stronger. So, um, I'll take a piece of my own advice after this and just listen with everything we're talking about with that in mind. It's also really easy for me to come up with ideas when I'm not in the heat of the moment with my own kids. So like brainstorming for parents when they bring me their issues is totally different than like thinking on the spot when you have your own stress hormones going on. So I have three kids, they're four, uh, six and nine, totally in the trenches. Remember those early days. They're really hard for me. So with all that in mind, just so glad you guys showed up here. There's a million things you could be doing. And one of the things I think we don't do enough is really practice giving in what we want to give out to our kids. Like we want our kids to be compassionate. We want them to be patient with themselves. We want them to have positive self-talk. And we actually really don't make those changes first by making a change with them. We make that change by making that change with ourselves. So maybe we can all just start by like telling yourself like, I, sh I could have been, I could, I could be taking a nap right now. Like I could be doing like a lot of different things and I'm here and I'm here to like maybe learn something new. Learning something new, I always feel like is a psychologically very challenging process because sometimes we have to confront guilt or like, oh, I didn't know that. Or, oh, did I mess something up? Or is that going to be hard? We have to actually confront so many hard feelings when we're learning. And that's, I truly think that's so brave. So like, this is a group of brave people coming together um, and doing it willingly. So just really give yourself credit for that. Um, and with that in mind. Yeah. Wait, at the beat. It was, it was amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, I feel like I hope shoulders were dropped at that moment. And I know for me, we talk about Vivi of just like, what is the one win that you got? And so if nothing else today, this is already your win. So congratulations for, for being here. And to kind of play off of that and this notion of, of being introspective as a parent, a big part of who you are, one of your core beliefs is this whole idea of being good inside. And it's informed so much of what you do. Can you share with the audience about how that belief might show up in your practice, both from a child perspective and from a grown-up perspective? Yeah, I mean, the name "Good Inside" wasn't a wasn't a coincidence. And actually, um, I am kind of like in this process of writing a book and put out some principles, and that's my number one principle. And actually, the idea that you are good inside and your kid is good inside to me, beyond being like a nice idea, like, oh, that's pleasant to think about. It actually creates a gap 
that allows you to be curious. That to me is what the most compelling thing is. Here's what I mean. Like if I'm good inside, why did I yell at my kids? Like if I'm good inside, why did I do this thing with my partner? If my kid is good inside, why did they hit their sister? Um, so actually holding on to that idea of like, my kid is good inside allows us to activate what I truly think is the single most important characteristic to have as a human being, which is not knowing and curiosity, right? And mm -hmm. it's why I, I, and you didn't do this, Gretchen, thank you. Like when people are like, oh, you're a, you're a parenting expert. I'm always like, please call Call me like besides the word influencer, nothing makes me cringe as much as the word expert. Both of those, like, oh, if you ever see me, please don't call me either things because experts know and influencers, I'm not going to talk about for another reason. I just don't identify that way. But um, not knowing it allows us to wonder. And um, I think we can all get to be much kind of better parents, ironically, from being like, okay, like, let me ground myself in this internal goodness. There's this kind of bad behavior. What, what happened in between? And in my practice, honestly, my, my best ideas for parenting doesn't come from any of the work with kids. In fact, I don't even work with young kids. I haven't for a very long time. I work with adults. Um, I always have in like kind of really intensive, you know, psychotherapy, really deep you know, trauma oriented, body oriented psychotherapy. And I always think, okay, so anything that was an, is an adult symptom. I hate that word symptom too, was a childhood adaptation. It's so pathologizing, like symptoms aren't real. They were adaptations we had to make in childhood to survive. And that would work for us and just no longer work now, but not surprisingly, our body is hesitant to give up things that were put in place to help us right in our earliest years. And so one of the things I've often thought about with adults is, okay, so if I get to know adults in my practice from that, okay, you're good inside, you're doing your best, but this is no longer working now, but your body's having a hard time unwinding this. Like what's the arc that got an adult to where they do things that no longer work for them based on their early years and wiring. And if we take that information and literally like reverse engineer it back to today's parents, then we can help today's parents wire their kids in ways where those kids' adaptations actually will work for them in adulthood, as opposed to if you're like me, you know, you're in like weekly therapy, like unwinding all your stuff and working really hard. Like it's, it's all good process, but how amazing if, if we could kind of intervene with that knowledge. And so where I would say to take this and make it practical, because that's always what I think we need to do is to really con like that idea of good inside isn't just like two words put together that like it's a really it's a really powerful way to ground yourself when you're struggling and like you can enter into that curiosity right the word why can be very judgmental why did I yell at my kid that's not really a why it's just judgment in the form of you know a question but like really why like where did that start what am I stressed out by what am I not getting like I'm a good person I don't want to yell at my kids I don't want to yell at my coworker. and same with my kid to apply that same foundation allows us to ask really important questions thank you it, it sounds like you're creating you're also creating like physical space to just pause for a minute like okay the next time this happens I, ha I don't have to solve this in the exact moment that I solved it last time. There's a pause to say, stop, hold on, breathe, let this go or try a new thing. Yeah, that's, that's the goal, right? And like, look, that's something I'm personally always working on too. I'm not terrific. That's why I talk a lot about it, right? So, um, but yeah, and it's, I think even grounding ourselves and like, okay, I'm a good parent, even though I don't know exactly why this is happening. Like really learning to be comfortable with not knowing, ironically, like allows us to discover so many important things. It's like this massive paradox for us, for our kids. Um, so yeah, I think that's just like a really powerful framework. Thank you. Um, and I think you you share this idea of thinking about reparenting ourselves, um, especially like what are the things we want to strip away that maybe were part of our uh, childhood and our parents raising us? And and in can you go a little bit deeper in sharing that term and and best practices to think about kind of at every stage before you have a baby with your partner or yes. how share how you want to share that approach with other adults that are maybe yes. in the support? And then I have a three and a half year old, and I'm I am so thankful that you can also 
decide to reparent at that stage too. And so oh my goodness. Amazing. Always, always, always. So, you know, this summer I've, I've started now that I have a larger following. It's amazing. People come up to me and they tell me their stories and they introduce themselves. I, I love it. I love every second that happens. And I was at this dinner and this maybe 22 year old, 21 year old, I don't know. She was so young. She came up to me and she, I think she treated me like I was like Brad Pitt. She like freaked out seeing me. And it was like the most exciting anyone's ever been to see me. And she's like, Dr. Becky, oh my God. And her friends at this table were like, who is this person? And she's like, oh, she's a child psychologist I follow. And again, they were like, who is this person? And she looked at them and she goes, if you guys aren't reparenting yourselves right now, you are missing out. It is going to act itself out later in your life. You've got to reparent yourself. You've got to follow child psychologists. And they were like, oh, I, I guess we have to be like following child psychologists. Interesting. And it was just so, I was like, you are like, you're amazing. I was like, so amazing. I wasn't thinking that way at 22. So whether you're 22, whether you're 82 or older or anywhere in between, what is reparenting? I mean, it's really the process of like giving yourselves the things you've always needed and didn't get initially in your life. And there's so much loss in that. Like, oh, I really didn't get certain things. Even if I believe probably everyone had well-intentioned parents, right? And I doesn't mean anyone's parents were horrible. Um, if you feel like your parents are horrible, that, that's allowed too. It means you didn't get what you needed. And that can be very sad. And there's this flip side of it, which is just also true that it's going to be insanely empowering to be like, oh, what if I, as the adult, like, what if I'm that adult I've been waiting for? Um, and if I want to be that adult to my kids, if I want to say, okay, I'm going to sit when they're upset and not say no big deal or look at the bright side, or I want to be that parent who, when my kid is crying and having a tantrum can have the calm and kind of let them absorb it from me. Well, if you didn't have parents who did those things for you, you're not destined to repeat that pattern, but you do have to look at where do those things come up in my life? Like, how am I at sitting and validating my own emotions versus invalidating them or saying they're not a big deal? When I'm, you know, really, really upset, can I talk to myself and almost like be the adult over here talking to the really upset part of me? Because we have to wire inside of us circuits that we want to have activated with our kids. We can't give out what we don't have in. And if we didn't initially get it, we literally have to give it to ourselves. I mean, anyone who follows me on Instagram probably knows I'm obsessed with internal family systems. If you haven't listened to the internal family systems audio room, I did with the founder of internal family systems. Talk about all the people I've met. I was like most starstruck by Dick Schwartz for sure. He's just brilliant. And the way he talks about healing, and understanding parts of ourselves. It's, it's just, I think he like truly understands how the mind works and how people can really change. So reparenting is, is looking at, yeah, where, what, what parts of me were untended to as a kid, right? I really believe all of our issues as adults, like kind of come from the parts of us that we were left alone with as a kid, alone with through punishment, through ignoring, through shaming, through um, being sent to our room, kind of through the message of, yeah, that part of you like doesn't fly in our family. That part is not gonna get love and connection and attention. And so we learn to shut it down in a very adaptive way, but guess what? Now your kid has that part come up and your body says, I know what to do, shut down, shut down. And you end up shutting it down in them, even though you really don't wanna reinforce that pattern. Well, we can't show up for them if we don't start showing up and connecting to that part in ourselves. And I could talk about this for an hour. I do in my reparenting workshop, but there are really things we can do to like, actually when people are like, what do you mean show up? Like, oh, well, here are these things you can actually do. And they actually change you internally. And, you know, I think the biggest surprise of parenting for anyone is like, first of all, if I'm doing it right, my kids teach me way more than I teach them. <laughs> and two, my kids trigger me. I kind of thought my kids were going to heal me. Like, what is that? Um, and they do trigger us. Um, but then we can go back to point one, that if we allow ourselves to be curious about those triggers, we can learn and grow so much and say like, wow, I watch myself heal and grow while I'm helping my kid grow. Like it's happening at the same time. And without a doubt, my parenting experience doesn't feel that like beautiful all the time. It definitely doesn't. But um, if we zoom out, there's really moments where, you know, we can do that. Thank you. Um, I'm sure everyone can raise their hand and say that they've been triggered by their kids a lot. So hopefully that means we're all being <laughs> successful parents. Um, and speaking of triggering, uh, we had so many parents ask questions about creating healthy boundaries, both for defining you as a, for the parent-child relationship, but then also just child and rules and yes and no. And what ways can you suggest 
striking that balance between there, I'm unpacking it a lot here, not only a structure that feels safe and a, and also fluidity to make a child feel respected and heard, but also where they feel okay to take risks and try hard things and not give up and build confidence without you kind of like jumping in and help us, <laughs> please. Separate a little bit. So we're talking about setting boundaries. <laughs> like there's a few things I like talking about as much as boundaries. So I'm gonna, I can't help myself, but answer that one. And the other side of it is like, how do we allow a space for our kids to take risks and struggle and fail? Cause we know how important that is, which relates to boundaries, but relates to other things too. So I'm just gonna talk about boundaries first. Boundaries are like a critical part of parenting. They're critical. Boundaries really are part of like a primary job we have, maybe the first job we have, which is keeping our kids safe and making decisions um, that keep them safe or that we think are good for them, safe physically, safe emotionally, when they can't make those decisions for themselves. So this happens a lot with your kids, So for, right? Where so many times we get into these frustration cycles with our kids and we think my kid's not listening or they're being defiant or they're being difficult. I hear this all the time. And almost always I come to the same common denominator. This isn't a listening issue. This is actually a parent not setting a boundary issue. So when a kid is out of control, whether it's my one-year-old keeps playing with the, I don't know, the outlet or my 18 month old is running around with a sharp knife. I don't know why that would happen, but it came to mind, right? Like they're just doing something out of control and dangerous. Or my two and a half year old always runs away from me on the sidewalk. And I say for all those things, stop doing that. We don't do that. I need you to stop. Please stop. No, no. The only thing we do in that situation is we have to be the boundary for our kids that they are exhibiting they cannot be for themselves. When a kid is out of control, asking them to get themselves back in control is, is an unreasonable ask. Like, and I feel from a kid's perspective, if they had words, they'd be like, you're watching me not able to make a good decision. Why do you think the right thing would be to ask me to make a good decision? Help me not have the bad outcome. So what does that mean? I'm not gonna let you play with the outlet. I need those scissors right now. Oh, you didn't give them to me. I know this isn't going to feel good. I'm going to take them from your hands because my number one job is to keep you safe. Not stop running away. I won't let you run away today. I know this is going to be tricky. I'm going to have to put you in the stroller when we walk. Yeah, I know. I know that's a bummer. I know that doesn't feel good. You are such an older kid. We're going to have to practice a lot more times walking next to me inside our house. It's going to be kind of funny um, because my number one job is to keep you safe. And right now, safety means putting you in the stroller, even if you don't like it. Right. Like every single time I can actually avoid the frustration of my kids not listening, my kid, because I'm actually being I'm willing. And I think as women, this is like a whole large issue, struggle to just like embody our authority and be like, uh, I'm the authority here and I'm going to set that boundary. My kid might be upset. That's OK. I can do the second part of my job. Oh, he wanted to play with that outlet. It's such a bummer. Oh, he wanted I would even say this to my kid. You really wish you would be able to run away, run around with a sharp knife. I know you really wish you could do that. Oh, I know that feels so fun to you. I'm never going to let you do that. But I get that's such a bummer, maybe something deeper. You wish you could make your own decisions. You wish you could decide everything for yourself. You wish you could walk on the sidewalk. I'm still empathizing with their feelings, but I'm setting a boundary. So actually, I think it's really powerful for everyone to reflect on whether you have a kid. This is also true with friends, right? Oh, my friend always, you know, my friend is always calling me at night. It's like, I wish she wouldn't call me. Like I'm going to bed, right? That might not be a uh, her issue. It might be a, my issue, not saying, Hey, I'm not going to be able to pick up the phone after 9:45, Right. Uh, oh, I just saw you called. I'm not able to talk. I need to get to bed early. Right. And so often we can get so frustrated with people, even resentful, right? So much of our resentment comes from our struggle to set a boundary early enough and soon enough. Does that mean it's your fault? No, I don't think it means it's your fault, but I often believe the only person we can really actively change is ourselves. And when we change and show up differently, the system around us tends to change. So a million more thoughts on boundaries, but that's like a quick thought. The other area is how can we set up a situation for our kids where they can explore and learn and play? Um, I think this starts with checking in with yourself and there's no right answers here and there's definitely no wrong answers. Just like where, how, how am I as a parent? Like how quick do I jump in? What types of things make me anxious? What is it like, like I know myself, how much leeway do I give myself 
to struggle to get things right or wrong? Am I someone who, oh, I like my bookshelf to look exactly like this. And oh, when it's a little cluttered, I have such a hard time. It's probably going to be harder for me to have my kids make a mess in art. It doesn't make me a bad person. It's just so important for me to check in with myself about. Do I always worry about my kids getting hurt? Do I know that about myself? I hear a cough and I go to the worst idea. It's not right or wrong. Oh, what's that going to look like on the playground when my kid is climbing, right? And I think, again, it goes to, we can do so much work on ourselves, right? Because probably that stuff showing up with our kids, it probably shows up in other areas of our life too. Um, and just really knowing, I always like as an adult, our job, like just knowing our stuff really matters so much. Um, and then I, I'm a big believer that right, kids learn by experience. That, that, that's all we learn by experience. We don't, they don't learn by words, right? That's cognition. Our thoughts are lovely, but they don't actually help wire our body. What wires our body is our experiences. So when we say, I want my kid to learn that it's okay to struggle and it's okay to have, you know, mess in their life, emotional mess, whatever it is, then we kind of have to put our money where our mouth is from an experience perspective. And even like letting your kids get messy, letting them get muddy, letting them with reason, oh, you want to climb those rocks? I, I, I kind of think, yeah, I'm going to stay back here. Um, they have to go through that to really believe in their own capability. Um, and so obviously everyone's different. You know, there's not one right way. You don't have to get, if you were like, oh, should I like put my six month old on rocks? Like, is that a good idea? Like probably not. Right. So we can use reason. Um, but going through those experiences, um, are what kids need to really feel that sense of mastery. I love it. But put your money where your mouth is, um, just feels so true here. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to, I have two questions that are directly from the audience that I want to go to. One is kind of before the baby comes and then one is when you have multiple kids. And so if you could try to distill prior to, you know, preparing for, for having your child, one single thing you can do before you give birth to think through how to bond and, and set up having a strong relationship with your child, with your baby, not with about, baby. not with your partner, not with your partner, not with your older. Oh, that's, that's a good one to think too, but yeah. Wait, thanks. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thinking about developing that strong parent child relationship from the start. You know, it's funny. I was talking, I don't know if any of you know this woman, Miley Teal. She's like one of my favorite people uh, I've met through this journey, but she and I were talking and we talked about, and I'm going to actually create this. I'm going to name it here. So no one takes it from me. I'm going to create an emotional registry. It's actually going to be like a PDF. Cause I feel like we spend so much time at like the bye-bye babies of the world, creating your registry and any parent after is like, the swaddle blanket, like, yeah, I needed one, but the time I spent there, like I probably could have spent the time emotionally preparing myself, emotionally preparing myself for what a baby really means and emotionally preparing my partnership, or if I don't have a partnership, a support system. So I'm just, I'm just saying this. I'm yes. Love it. You heard it here. It's being recorded <laughs> heard it first. Um, okay. So what would I do in terms of the baby? You know, the thing that gets in our way the most in any area of life and definitely in bonding with our baby is the way we judge the feelings we're having in the moment. Like if we just like, I always, I'm a visual person. So I like to like go like this, like in any situation, there's a feeling. And then there's the way we talk to a feeling or our reaction to the feeling. Our feelings don't give us problems ever. They're just, they're somatic sensations running through our body. They're natural. We all have the same ones, they're feelings. We've all learned very different ways over the course of our childhoods and lives to talk to our feelings. And either the way we talk to our feelings kind of like hugs them and like, they're still there, but like everyone feels better, right? With a little hug or they attack them or they actually act in a way that balloon them up bigger. And I think that's really critical whenever we're having a hard time to even remind yourself, okay, like how am I talking to the feeling? Because even though I think the feeling's giving me a problem, it's probably not. So how does that relate to bonding with your baby? Okay, a couple truths I think about babies. I'm just gonna put this out there. Babies are not that fun. They're not that fun. I'm just going to say it. Uh, I didn't find babies that fun. I love my kids. Now, if you're like me, I do find babies fun. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me either. So if you find babies fun, that's all going to be great, right? That's in some ways easier. But babies are a ball of dependency. They really are. And actually checking in about your temperament, I think is really important here because if you love in general, you love cuddling and you love being close to people in that way. And you actually really are like, oh, I love caretaking. You might actually find it easier early on. If you're someone who's like, I just 
love independence. Like I, I know like that's more me. The baby stage is going to be harder. Neither is right or wrong, but again, knowing where you are helps you prepare. Why? Because to be able to say to yourself at any moment, I'm noticing this feeling and I'm allowed to feel it totally changes your relationship with the feeling because the thing that really gets in our way of bonding with the baby is usually the narrative of I'm not supposed to feel this way. I'm a horrible parent. I wonder if anyone else felt this way. What's wrong with me? I'm never going to, it's all these things we say after. So like, this is a quick strategy. It's like my number one go-to it's in like so many of my workshops. And so he's like a baseline. I call, I'm a big acronym person, AVP, like acknowledge, validate, permit. I would just be practicing this skill. And it's so useful in every area of life. Acknowledging is the process of naming a feeling and I'll go through it. Validating is telling yourself the story of why the feeling makes sense. There's just something about the phrase makes sense that our body loves. I feel like it's like our emotions, like get validation from our brain. And it's like, oh, all is connected. It just loves it. And then permit is the really the process of just giving yourself permission for the feeling you're having, which always feels a little funny to me. Cause I'm like, I'm giving my body permission to do what it's doing. Like it's already doing it, but there's still power in it. So what might that look like? Oh, I feel really, really exhausted. And you know, right now I feel really exhausted. And I, let's just say, I kind of wish I was just like anywhere else, but like in my home with my newborn, I'm acknowledging it, right? Validation being a parent is really hard. And there's a lot of unenjoyable times. And I remember that Dr. Becky person saying babies aren't fun for everyone. So I guess it makes sense that I'm daydreaming about being on a beach with my friends, as opposed to being home with my crying infant. I, I guess that makes sense. What does permission sound like? I give my body full permission to be feeling this feeling. I like to go further. And I like love actually using the word body because I think it, it's very respectful. Um, my body will know when it kind of feels this to its end point. Like I can trust my body. And here's where the internal goodness comes in. I'm a good parent who's not enjoying spending time with her baby right now. Like I'm a good person who's having this feeling. I am because at the end of the day, what spirals us, I think always is deep down. There's some like questioning of that good insideness. That's really deep down what happens, right? Like, am I a bad person? Am I a bad parent? Or we do the error, which is so important to catch early on is when we take an experience today and we project to that being the reality, however long from now, I'm always going to feel this way. I'm never going to be bonded with my baby. Fast forward to, oh my God, my kid bit someone. Are they going to be the kid who bites someone at kindergarten? My kid's clinging to me. Are they never going to be able to join a group? Like, one of my personal mantras that my therapist always gives me is now. And I do this in my life all the time. Now, 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 now my kid's having a biting problem. What does my kid need now? Now my kid is clinging. What would I need if I was clinging to my husband at a party? Would I want him to look at me and say, you're embarrassing me. You need to cope you with other people. Or would I want him to say to me now, take your time. There's something that's uncomfortable. You'll figure this out. I can tell you definitely the latter, um, right now. Okay. Right now, this moment with my baby is really hard and I'm not feeling particularly close to him. It's not predictive of how I'm going to feel tomorrow or years from now. So going in with that kind of AVP strategy, it's such a good thing to practice in your daily life. Even when you don't need it, I set alarms sometimes just to do, I just literally write AVP. What, what can I acknowledge my heart? Oh, I do kind of feel a little bit stressed right now. I actually want to be doing anything. I have so much work to do. I don't want to be slowing down. That makes sense. It's hard for me to slow down and just ground myself. Oh, I give myself permission to be annoyed doing this exercise. Like it's just a muscle. I'm constantly working. This is, uh, that was my moment for, um, kind of having, wow, a wow moment because what you're, what you're basically suggesting is something that can be a life now a lifelong practice. So starting with your yes. baby, now we're moving into the rest of your life. You're going to continue to do this and that's going to support you as a good parent. And then the second child arrives and are you doing anything different? How are you staying connected with each child so that no one feels like too much time um, is going to one another? Are they, is it different? Is it the same? What's, what's new about adding another child or, or, or two? <laughs> yeah. Um, so much is different. Um, the transition to baby number two is, is really tricky. And like, that doesn't mean I think people shouldn't do it. I obviously did it twice. I have three kids, but um, a couple of things I think are key in that transition. And this is actually more general than that. Whenever we have to start catching ourselves saying like, how can I get my kid to not feel jealous? 
How can I get my kid to do this? How can I get my kid to stop this? How can I get my kid to love the baby? We never get anyone to do anything. That's actually, you know, my husband would be like, stop trying, then listen to your own advice, Becky. You're always telling me to do things, right? So I'm gonna listen to my own advice, but we don't. And every time we say, how can I get my kid to this? We can always replace that with what's going on for my kid that they are doing that, or they might be feeling that. And how can I show up in a way that feels as good to me as like kind of my child's leader. So we can't get our kids not to feel jealous. Instead, my, our older kids, okay, what might this transition be like for my older kid? And how can I speak to that? And what can I do to show up in a way that I feel good about? Now we're like grounding ourselves in ourselves, right? Um, so a couple things about that transition. I'll start with your older child. Like if there's one piece of advice, I have a million pieces of advice about the transition to the second child. It's actually the topic of an entire course I have. So, so much to say, but if there's one, it would be to speak early about the fact that your child is going to have multiple conflictual feelings about becoming a big sibling. Like we do our kids the biggest disservice. Oh, Kira, are you so excited? It's going to be amazing. Or we just don't talk about it at all. Their whole world is turned upside down, like their whole world. And it's Adele Faber and Elaine Maslisch, not my original metaphor. So I'm sure many of you guys have heard it, but there's like, imagine your partner coming home and being like, I have the best news for you. We're getting a second wife and you're going to be the big wife and they're going to be the little wife. And you're just like, love every minute. It's going to be amazing. And you'd be like, why would I like that? Like, and then everyone you saw on the street was like, how is it being the second wife? Do you love it? They're like, you'd, you'd be like, I'm in the twilight zone. Like what? And then one day you like, go take this woman's blouse and steal it. And everyone's like, Becky, like, you can't do that. <laughs> right. And I always feel like, I'm like, I took her blouse. She took my life. Like what, the, why am I in trouble here? What the heck? Right. Like it just, that's what it's like for our kids. Right. And if my, <laughs> you know, if my husband had to have a second wife, okay, which is a ridiculous thing to say, I'd want him at least to be like, you might not like this. It <laughs> might be a hard transition. I get that a part of you might, very small part, right? But a part of you might love having someone else around and over time, it's gonna feel great. But a part of you might feel nervous and tricky and worried about getting alone time with me and might even feel mad. We can only regulate the feelings we allow ourselves to have. That is like a principle. We can only regulate, we can only manage feelings that we allow ourselves to have. And kids, without us realizing, are constantly asking us, am I allowed to have this feeling? Am I allowed to have that feeling? Is it okay to feel this way? Am I still a good kid when I'm feeling this way? And we have to give them permission for that. You know, parents often say to me like, but am I putting that idea in their head? No, we don't put feelings in kids' heads. We don't put ideas in their heads. I feel like we have to respect kids too much, right? Now, what I say to my kid, you're gonna hate every second of it and it's gonna destroy your life. No, I wouldn't say that either, you know? But I would just say, I'm having another baby and here's what that means and it's okay. And I think this is so helpful for kids. It's okay if part of your body, like maybe over here feels like kind of excited and kind of over here, you're like, Ooh, I don't know if I want that. And kind of over here, you're mad, mad, mad. And, you know, kind of over here, you're nervous, not because feelings live in the part, those parts of our body, but the idea of multiple feelings at once is too hard for kids to understand. It's too hard for most adults to understand. So really grounding it in the body helps. I still remember when my older son, after I had my second one, came up to me one day and was like, this part of me really wants you to send her back to the hospital. And this part of me like thinks it's kind of okay. And like, I remember a friend was over who I love and she was like, oh, I can't believe he said that. But it was like a psychologist dream. I was like, that was so beautiful. You know, and she's like, <laughs> okay, um, that's what we want, right? Because, and I remember saying to my son, I have a lot of different feelings about it too, which I did part of it. So many, many of us were scared, we're nervous. Like, so normalize that really, really important. Our kids have their whole lives to develop their relationship. And it's okay if your kid's not interested. It's okay if they're angry again, let's not do that fast forward thing, come back to the now. And the other thing I'd say is in that beginning stage to really make sure you're carving out time with your kid. That, you know, what's kids number one fears? Abandonment. And like, while we're not kicking our kids to the curb, kids have abandonment fears evoked when they're just not getting the same amount of time. So carve out that one-on-one -on -one time. I still remember when I had a picture with, um, was when I had my third and it was my the three kids and me and my husband, we were trying to get like a family picture. And my older one was giving us the hardest time. And eventually he said to me, 
can we just get a picture with the original three? That's what he said. He meant like him and me and my husband, like the original three, right? That's how we came into the world. And like every kid initially was like, am I still going to get alone time? Am I going to still get cared for? It's actually an evolutionary concern. It's not a selfish one. And just being mindful of that, being mindful that your older kids really, they need that time with you to just actually feel stable and the more stable they feel with you. The more they can see a sibling as a playmate. This is part of a longer sibling discussion. Sibling rivalry isn't actually an issue between siblings. It's acted out between siblings, but it's a sign your kid doesn't feel kind of entirely stable in their family system. And the more they shore up their relationship with you, the more they can look to their sibling as a friend. Same thing in a workplace. If you're feeling so solid about your job and there's some superstar next to you as a colleague, you can be friends with them and celebrate them. If you're feeling like your job's on the line or you're feeling like your boss isn't giving you the time of day, you hate your colleague, right? And you're gonna not be nice to them. It's not really about them. It's a statement of how you feel in the system. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think we have um, time for, unfortunately, one question, okay. though I hope you've, um, or you've, hope you've heard your questions being answered along the way. Um, we tried really hard to do that. So um, you can start putting questions in the chat function, but I think I'm gonna call on someone from that chat to do, do one question. Uh, so it, be prepared to talk if that's okay with the audience. Or jump in just now and say, hey, give me my question. <laughs> Who has a question? Can they unmute themselves, Gretchen? I don't even know. Julia Thibode, I'm gonna find you, Julia. Where are you? There she is. I'm, I'm here with my newborn and I just was like, on the verge of tears listening to you talk about um, siblings because I have a three-year-old and just very real. I, I think that might've been my question that I sent in um, about finding time. And this is like the new, new, she's one week old. Um, so uh -huh. it's, it's figuring that out um, has been a whirlwind and it's, it's really, um, I loved what you said and I loved following the things that um, you've shared. So thank you for, for that answer. It was really powerful for me to hear. Oh, good. Thanks, Julia. And, and the other thing I'll say is also just, I think one of the interesting things, right, and I don't know, it'd be interesting to see a raise of hands. Like one of the things I remember being hard, like just hardest about the early stages of parenting is like when something didn't go well, it, it was so hard for me to like wait to the next day, like a, a feeding didn't go well. And it's just like, oh, this is like, it feels like the truth. It feels like the truth. And like, but then like your kid's in a good sleeping phase and that feels like the truth. And then your kid is arguing with their siblings all the time, or maybe your older one's having a really hard time and it just feels like the thing. Um, and I, I don't, I don't really know if like, there's a way around that, but just kind of reminding yourself, like I found the phrase, like, this is a stage, like, this is a stage. This is a stage. This is, I always feel like difficult stages. What I, the only thing I know about them is they last longer than you want them to. That, that's they always last longer than you want them to and I would always say like this is a stage okay all stages last longer than I wanted to so probably tomorrow my kids will be at each other again or probably my older one's gonna have a tantrum and this is a stage like you know it's not like it turned the whole thing around but it is a helpful thing to remind myself um I, I see Marissa with her hands up so I think I wanted I'm to oh sorry go oh, oh. Is hi hi go for it Hi, hi. I was just typing my question, um, but I, I'll just speak it instead. Um, so I feel like, like we are deep in the tantrum stage. My daughter just turned two. Um, and I think like I've read so much on how to handle these and what to do. But I think like in the moment, my husband and I feel like we just like freeze. And then when it's over, I'm always like questioning, like, did I do that right? Am I like messing her up? <laughs> for the long term, like, well, I'll usually just end up like sitting there, like watching her go nuts and just making sure that she's like, not going to hurt herself. Um, if, but if I try to talk to her in that moment, like she's screaming so loud and, and tantruming so hard that like, she can't hear what we're saying, or obviously she can't even listen to reason in that moment. So afterwards I'm like, oh my God, what did I do that? Right. Like, I'm, I think I'm always wondering, like, did I do that? Right. <laughs> my so, question. So, um, you sound like you're doing, I mean, I, I hate using the word right, you know, because it just yeah. to feel like it's wrong, but um, it feels like you're doing the thing. That's what I would say, right? I mean, kids, like kind of, I was saying kids learn through experience. I really think kids learn emotion regulation through absorption. Like that, that's, that's why the work we do on ourselves is so important. They absorb it. They don't, 
They don't hear the right words. Even when I model on Instagram, the words like, oh, you wish, whatever it is, right? Like you wish you could have ice cream for breakfast. The wish, it, it's not like anything special about that word. It's the tone. It's that a kid feels seen. Dan Siegel would say a kid feels felt. I feel like that's just such a genius term, right? And there are some kids or some moments with kids where you're like, yeah, even that, like my kid is like off in another world. They're like, they're, they're lost, right? I know a lot of these kids I think are like these deeply feeling kids where their tantrums happen more often. Like they get set off more easily and they're more intense and they last longer. Like my middle was that. And is, is that, um, and I remember being like, wait, like this didn't go the way it did for your brother. Like we had some tough moments, but like, I feel like that you're not, you're, you're not responding in the same way. It's not your fault. These kids are different. And when kids are in that state, they are in full fight or flight, right? They're in full animal defense mode. And what do you do? The only thing you can do is exactly what you're doing. I, I, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, but I, and it's kind of confusing, but like I imagine it and I'm glad we're on the zoom is like, you literally hold space. Let me explain why. When kids are that out of control, the way they experience their body, they're like, my feelings are attacking me. They are dangerous. They are scary. And they are so dangerous and scary. They were exploding out of me. I am like this overflowing fountain. And that's what it looks like, right? With one of these massive tantrums, they look like this overflowing fountain of dysregulation. That is what it is. So what do we do? I'm a big believer. We have to first take the kid into a smaller room. Like literally, I mean that concretely. If you're an overflowing fountain and you're experiencing yourself like that, being in like a kitchen or being in like an open living room or being in the backyard only gives you more space to, um, to destroy. I mean, obviously we don't think that's happening, but that's how kids experience it. They're like, I'm just taking over. I'm destroying the world around me. Look how awful and bad this is. When you take a kid into a smaller room and close the door and sit inside, that's all so important. Smaller room, close the door, sit inside. So specific, so important. I learned so much about this from my adult clients who've taught me so much about what they needed and specific specifically going back to times and then painting the picture. And they literally all tell me the same things. It's amazing. What does that do? It creates space. It's like kind of saying, this feels so scary and overwhelming to you, but it only goes this far. Like, I'm not gonna let you destroy the world around you. I'm not gonna let you even feel like that's happening. That's why we all also stop them from like throwing a vase. Cause we're like, I'm, I'm stopping you from throwing the vase. Not, not just because I happen to like the vase, but because I wanna show you that the feelings that feel so scary and destructive to you I see them, but I'm not going to actually confirm that they're actually so, so destructive and scary in the world. That's what, and so why do, why else do we take them into the room and sit there and sitting is key with the door closed, not standing. I will never forget. I'm forever indebted to someone I still see in my practice who is one of these deeply feeling kids and didn't get what she needed because understandably many parents take the bait of leave me alone. And, you know, and, and they, and she said, I, she said, if my parent would have been standing in front of the door, no way. And I was like, well, why not? She's like, I would think they'd be scared. They'd be wanting to leave. They were just waiting to leave. They were just waiting. If they were sitting, I'd be like, oh, like they're really not going anywhere. I could cry when I think about this like intense session. And I even think about parents I've worked with, my own kids, like sitting at the door. And what do you do? This is what you do when you're sitting. You first regulate yourself. You remind yourself. I really mean this. This is my child's emotional storm, not mine. I am seeing the storm, I'm around the storm and I'm around the storm because I know it's not a storm. Like, like there's not actually a tornado that's gonna kill anyone. It feels like that to them, but like I can see it and stand a little bit outside of it. So saying to yourself some version of that, I can get through this, this is not an emergency. This is not a dangerous situation. I can get through this. The only thing you really are supposed to do in that situation is ground yourself. Take them into a smaller space and ground yourself. People like to have some words. So what words are somewhat helpful? I'm here. I actually say out loud, like, cause my kid often will be saying that, say, get out of the room. Right. And parents will say to me, like, don't you respect a kid's words? I deeply respect a kid's words. But if my kid was in that state and wanted to cross a New York city street without holding my hand. And I said, no, you know, I'd basically say no expletive way. I'm going to let you do that. Not because I don't respect your words, but because I love you and you're not in a place to be making good decisions for yourself. And I'm not going to let you get hit by a car. Right. So it's the same thing emotionally, right? Those kids often say what they fear. They say what they fear. Leave me alone. I believe if anything, they're talking to this scary, scary feeling inside of them. They're not talking to their loving parent. So I stay and I say something like this. It's my decision to stay. You don't have to like it, but I'm here. 
or I'll say my number one job is to keep you safe. I think probably if you follow me, you know, I say that all the time and I actually do. And right now safety means staying in your room. You don't have to talk to me. I don't even have to look at you. The eye contact can feel really intense for kids like that. It's truly like if they're in an animal defense state, it feels like too provocative. So I wouldn't, I just say, I'm not going to even look at you. I'm just going to focus on my breathing. You do your thing. And then I'll often say, I know this feels awful to you. I'm not scared of your feelings. I'll say it like that. You can say that in a way that feels like, I'm not scared of your feelings. I say it in a pretty assertive way. I'm staying, I'm not scared of your feelings. So I'm staying right here. You don't have to like it. We don't have to talk. I'm staying right here. I'm not going to say another word for a little bit. I'm right here. That's it. And then you wait it out. And I have been in moments, it's been 20 minutes, 20. And I'm like, and I'm, I do this stuff. I'm like, is this right? Is this right? It always ends the same way. There's an eventual collapse. There's never a like, oh, you're the best mom. Never, I've never had that. But there's like, there's a softening that happens. Um, and so what I'd say is that it, it feels remarkably unproductive. It feels insanely exhausting. After that, I'm like, is it bedtime? And my husband's like, it's four o'clock. I'm like, okay, well, it's bedtime for me. Um, it's exhausting. It's not fun for anyone. Um, but really remember like your kids during what they're really absorbing from you is what they need, which is this feeling. First of all, my, my parent is only letting it go this far. That's the boundary. That's the space. My parent by staying there is saying to me in a way words can never communicate. I'm, I'm not as scared of this as you are. Um, this feeling that you feel like is expanding. I'm not moving away. Cause I'm like, Oh no, get away from me. Like I can hold space. And over time that does more for a kid than any words than anything else. That is just massive. It's what these deeply feeling kids really need. Um, Ooh, Dr. Becky, oh, oh, space nothing like, a, nothing like a, light, a light Thursday night, oh. light Thursday zoom for everyone. <laughs> that was a brilliant way to end. You, you started thinking about creating space and being curious to giving space to your child. Um, there are no more words to say other than thank you. Um, we are so grateful for your time. I see so many head nods and eye wipes and, and really people dialing in and, and I'm, we're grateful for you. We're grateful for everyone who showed up. Um, you can, can I, can I add one more thing Yeah, in that room with your kid when they're like that is very, very hard. And many parents will be like, I can't stay there in a regulated way. Right. That goes back to our stuff and hopefully the way we're working on ourselves. If you need to say to your kid, I need to step out of the room. It's not your fault. I need to calm down my body. I'm right outside your room. Maybe you like have a note you slip under. I'm going to come back. That's the same thing, right? Like, is it like, if you can say great, if you're like, I just can't, and I'm working on that and I'm working on my own regulation, all that stuff. Great. But like, that's, that's allowed to, right. You're like, <laughs> it's more than allowed to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, there is not no getting enough of Dr. Becky and her words. And so please go to her um, website, find a podcast, Dr. Becky good inside, follow her on Instagram. Um, keep asking one another these questions. It's a wonderful community out there. And um, we will be sure at Vivi to follow up with some important resources for you, but kudos. We're just so, so happy to spend some time with you, Dr. Becky. You are. Well, I'm so happy to be here. Nothing in real life is as simple or straightforward as it sounds in this webinar. And the thing I would say is whenever you're doing something new, it's going to feel really weird in your body. Being prepared for that is so key. That weirdness is actually a sign your body is creating a new circuit right? Like if you're used to going down the same ski slope a million times, and then you went down a different ski slope and someone was like, but this one feels weird. Someone would be like, well, of course, like you went down the other one 3 million times. And this is the first time, of course it feels weird. And so getting into a good relationship with that awkwardness is so powerful as a parent. Cause you're like, it feels weird to stay in with my kid in the room, going back to that AVP, it feels weird. That makes sense. They actually said it would feel weird because it's new. It's allowed to feel weird. And that doesn't mean I'm doing something wrong that really allows us to, to make those changes. Yeah. Getting so dirty thank you for being here. here. Thank you for having me. Love connecting, love seeing all your faces. Like what an amazing group of human beings. I can just tell from all your engagement and your reactions. So, and the way we started, give yourself credit, take one thing from today. Really don't take more than one. It's like too much for our brains to handle. Take one, try it out. It won't be as easy as it sounds here. It isn't for me either with my real kids. Um, so just says so much that we're all here together. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so everybody. much. Have Bye. a great day, everybody. Bye.